very much. I've been, I'm, I'm a new member of Parliament. I'm the MP for Wigan, and it's an area with significant pockets of deprivation, the sort of area that Alan was talking about in his speech. I'm also a member of the Education Select Committee, and I've spent the last seven or eight years before I came into Parliament working with some of the most disadvantaged children and young people in the country. And I just wanted to start by saying that while I think that the Coalition's policies are immensely problematic for the vast, vast majority of young people, I think they will be absolutely catastrophic for the most disadvantaged children in this country. It's inevitable, of course, that when you have cuts to public spending, it will have an impact. But what has astonished me is how hard these cuts have hit children and young people in particular. Not just the cuts to universal services like the NHS or um, provisions that we all use, which will have an impact on everybody, but the significant programmes like Sure Start, like Universal Child Benefit, School Scorts, Building Schools for the Future, Connections, Youth Services. There's a whole raft of things that are just hammering children and young people one after the other. And what has been particularly pernicious to watch is the abolition of the child poverty targets and the dismantling of Sure Start, because I'm not going to stand here as a Labour politician and pretend that Sure Start was a magic solution, that it works brilliantly in every area. But in constituencies like mine in Wigan, particularly the most deprived communities, it has had a huge impact. And we all know, because the evidence is absolutely clear, that what happens to children before the age of five is the major determinant in their life chances. And most of those children, if they're not given those opportunities, they will never, ever catch up with their better off peers. And in 2011, that is an absolutely damning legacy that we are creating and that we are leaving for future generations. And I just want to dwell briefly on something that Alan talked about, the major crisis facing this generation, and that is youthful employment, predicted to reach one million this spring. That is the highest level that we've seen in this country since records began 20 years ago. And I have spent much of the last seven or eight years in the voluntary sector being pretty critical of the Labour government. I think that there are a lot of good things that they did for children and young people, but there are particularly children and young people that we worked with where, um, where they didn't catch up. But youth unemployment was not one of those areas. I saw the efforts that went into tackling youth unemployment in 1997. And of course, I would have liked to have seen more done, and I would like to have seen it done faster, and I always will, because that's the sort of background that I come from, and that's the perspective that I have. But what is happening at the moment is exactly the opposite of that. Um, and it's not just a moral case, it's not just obviously important to everybody in this room that we create that sort of society where what you, what you do with your life is much more important than what you're born into. It's also an economic case. The Royal Bank of Scotland and Prince's Trust brought out a report recently They said that we're losing £10 million a day in lost productivity because we're not making this our major focus. So we ought to be. And with six people chasing every single job in this country, we should be providing a decent safety net for those who can't find work. Even George Bush raised benefits when it became apparent that there wasn't enough work for people. And instead, we're seeing the opposite. We should be creating apprenticeships. We should be providing diverse routes into education instead of what we're seeing, which is a narrowing of the curriculum with the English Baccalaureate and a devaluing of the alternative routes that are an absolute lifeline for some of the children and young people in this country who come from deprived, deprived backgrounds. The Future Jobs Fund is something that I wanted to dwell on because it, it came too late. Um, and so it only had just started to have an impact when the election came. But I've seen for myself in Wigan what that meant for young people. It was 100,000 paid real jobs for young people, and most of those jobs lasted, that those young people got into, got into employment. And what we've seen instead is the creation of 50,000 apprenticeships in the last budget. It sounds fantastic, <coughs> um, at a cost of 300 million, but when you compare that to the sort of money that was found for the fuel duty cut or for, um, for tax breaks for the biggest multinational corporations, it is quite simply a drop in the ocean. And it's not even real, because these aren't, these aren't jobs, these aren't apprenticeships, they're a target. And the idea is that employers will move in, private employers, and they will foot the bill and they will create these apprenticeships. Most of the major employers have said they simply don't think that's going to happen. But even if it does happen, that's 12,500 young people out of the 1 million out of work and 800,000 who aren't even counted in those figures because they're not actively seeking work at the moment but aren't in education or employment. We should be concerned about this because, as Alan said, this has a long-lasting damaging effect. It affects young people for every year they're out of work, 
more than anybody else, and we ought to be making this our priority. And I just, at the, at the end of this, I just wanted to dwell very briefly on education, because this is at the root, I think, of the sort of society that we're trying to create. This is a choice. We've seen an astonishing amount of money already spent on academies. We've seen two and a half million so far in answer to a parliamentary question that I tabled. Michael Gove said 20 academies have converted at a cost of two and a half million pounds from central government funds. He won't tell me how much he's spending on his pet free schools initiative, but it's likely to be millions, millions more. IFS, the respective think tank, have said that education spending is now at its lowest level as a proportion of the national income since 1962. Tuition fees have been hiked up to nine grand. Sure, there's a package of support for the very, very poorest students. But what we're saying to the majority of not very well off people is that what we want you to do is saddle yourselves with debt for up to 30 years. And at the same time, we want you to pay into your own pension pot. We want you to help subsidise your parents' generation for pension pots. We want you to help look after them when they become elderly. We want you to get on the housing ladder and we want you to have kids. I mean, I just think as a deal for your people, that is absolutely important. And what, the only thing that appalls me more than that, actually, is the, the removal of the EMA and the abolition of aim higher. Because the EMA was not, as, as, as ministers have suggested, some kind of bribe to get young people into employment. It, in my into education, in my constituency, it had become an absolutely essential part of household income for three quarters of the kids who stayed on at college. And now, what we're saying to 80% of EMA recipients who have household incomes of under £21,000 is you don't need that money and you should go to college without it. What essentially we're saying to young people is if you are prepared to walk long distances and go hungry and do without the textbooks and the equipment that you need, you might, you just might, have a shot at the same opportunities as your better off peers. Is that really the extent of our ambition for young people in this country in 2011? And I just wanted to leave you with one final thought. Last year, China and India produced 8 million graduates. If you compare that with the cut in the university teaching work of 80% that we've seen under this government, it is absolutely astonishing and it's absolutely stark. The reason China and India, in times of desperate financial need, are investing in young people is because in the long run it benefits us all. The case is a moral one, absolutely a moral one, but it's also an economic one. This is desperately, desperately short-sighted and we will come to regret it. Thank you.